all know me, know how I earn a living. This shark, swallow you whole. I value my neck a lot more than 3,000 bucks, Chief. You'll find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for ten. Ten thousand dollars for me by myself. For that you get the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. You yell shark. We've got a panel on our hands on the 4th of July. Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the wreck of the boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. A what? You're gonna need a bigger potion. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. Now, I'm not saying that this is not the shark. It probably is, Martin. It probably is. It's a man-eater. It's extremely rare for these waters. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. Swimming around in a place where the feeding is good until the food supply is gone, right? It's called territoriality. It's just theory that I happen to agree with. How correct was Matt Hooper in his agreement with the theory of territoriality? Thank you very much for returning back in the Jaws obsession where we are here to share with you, prove to you, convince you, or remind you that Jaws is the greatest movie of all time. Thank you very much for returning for this episode 74, Territoriality. Have we ever stopped to think how Matt Hooper stumbled upon the aggressive shark phenomenon in the waters around Amity Island at the age of 12 and grew up thinking that was normal shark behavior? And whose theory of territoriality was Matt Hooper agreeing with? I wanted to dive right into this. This was, a, this was an episode I wanted to get to for a very long time because some of the talk, rogue sharks and territoriality, as well as how sharks are talked about in Jaws, might seem archaic. But that was the conventional wisdom at the time. If we look back at the information that was available at the time, Matt Hooper would have been absolutely in agreement with some of the leading scientists at that time on sharks. So in this episode, what I wanted to do was sort of get into Matt Hooper's mindset at the time and figure out just what was he going to do on the Aurora that he mentions in that scene. We're going to break all that up on this episode 74, Territoriality. And I have some great material here that I was uh, going that I was going through that we know was on the set of Jaws. It will be very interesting to see some of the conclusions that come out of this. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to everyone out there in the Jaws obsession. Always great to be back, and thank you for your time, lending your time in seeing what's going on here in the Jaws obsession. The Book of Quint showed up under some Christmas trees, I see. Uh, I'm getting emails and messages. Newly acquired Books of Quint and readers around the world. It's great to see. We're hearing from all the readers. The, the Amazon reviews are starting to stack up. We're sailing full speed ahead into the new year, 2024. With full sales, wind is in our sails. It's great to see uh, with the January 23rd U.S.-Canada rollout of the Book of Quint. I've had readers send me pictures that they've had relatives in England send them a book from over there. So we are right where we need to be. Remember, remember, the Peter Benchley timeline. That is what we are on, that Jaws was going to be published. 50 years ago in February of 2024. So the Double Day edition was published in February of 1974. And that was the hardcover edition. And so that's what we're doing. Was we, we, we are now, we are still on that Peter Benchley timeline. If we are going to be looking at a Book of Quint 
feature film in 2025. Game is still on. We are still full speed ahead. And of course, the Book of Quint is making waves and the numbers speak for themselves. That the fan base is responding, that the reviews of the Book of Quint are overwhelmingly positive. And that can only mean great things as Universal contemplates if they want to take this project on. It's a great time for Jaws fans. It's very exciting. I did get a present for Christmas here. I got an Amazon Kindle myself. Santa brought me one. There was one under the tree. And it's a new experience for myself. I'd never had one before. I was, um, I all, I always have been a traditional book reader where uh, I like a paper to turn the page. So e- e-books are new to me, and this, um, and I was very excited to try a real e-reader with, with the one I am currently using is the Kindle Paperwhite, and it has the display with the adjustable, it's an adjustable warm light to uh, where you can even take the backlight off and it looks just like paper. What, it's, very, it's very interesting. What I've noticed is that it's a completely new experience with reading. You can adjust the fonts font size, you can uh, you can change the font. You can put it in the publisher font, what Amberly chose to publish uh, the Book of Quint in, or you can change the font to suit your reading style and preference. Very interesting. One of the things that I learned is that I'm learning now as an author is that I focused a lot on how the book, how it lays on the page that the presentation that when you uh, open the book of Quint up and you flip through it, I was very concerned of never having big bricks of text, and I wanted to break that up. If you listen to this broadcast in, in previous episodes, I would talk about Ernest Hemingway and how he was um, uh, trained as a journalist, and when he would write, uh, when you would re- flip through a Hemingway book, uh, visually, you can see there is a lot of uh, white space and the sentence breakup, the paragraph breakup. It's easy on the eyes. And psychologically, it, I, I always felt that it was easier to read Ernest Hemingway because it wasn't a difficult page of just a giant brick of text. Now, and there are some other books that were extremely difficult. If I, you know, I could show you Herman Melville uh, and Moby Dick with uh, some of those pages where they're... they're uh, it's work. It's a lot of work to get through. And my and I was very self-conscious about that when writing and how also how the, the structure, how it lays on the page and how it's presented to the reader. I was very self-conscious about that. But with the Kindle now, as readers uh, expand the font, that whole dynamic changes. That whole factor is taken out of the equation in how the Book of Quinn is presented on the e-reader systems which is very interesting to me. So I'm learning all about that. It's very interesting to learn the differences between the different mediums that readers now consume books, traditional e-reader, and of course we have audiobook. And for those that don't know, the audiobook is now in production. That's going to be exciting. That's the third stage of the Book of Quint rollout that is hopefully, and I would like to, um, I still haven't gotten an update on the dates of release on the audiobook yet but I'm hoping that it will be later in January. We will see about that. Very exciting still. So Kindle, and another thing about the Kindle is that you can actually leave a review right from your Kindle now. You can leave that five-star review that I hope you will do, and it will go right to Amazon and post up. You can also highlight different segments in the novel. If you have a favorite sentence, you can highlight that. And that will add to the highlighted, uh, that, that will let other readers know what you've highlighted. So that will, uh, I've, I've read, I'm reading some other novels on this Kindle, and I've seen that there would be 10,000 people or 5,000 people highlighted this sentence as their favorite sentence or one of their favorite sentences. And it, it's, it's interesting. It actually brings readers together more. It's really interesting. The experience is it's, it's much more profound. The experience is much more in-depth as people come together through this technology. And that's also leads to the review through your Kindle. You can go right to Goodreads. Goodreads is, and if you go to goodreads.com, it's also an app. You can download the app. You make an account there, and you actually have a virtual bookshelf. So you can put uh, 
three shelves. You can say what you want to read, you can say what you are reading, and then you can have a setting of books that you read. So everyone has different friends and connections on there, and you can follow your favorite authors and see what they're reading as well. And what happens is, is that it becomes this organic experience where everybody is following. People can actually share and talk about books that they are reading in real time. And that's all from the Kindle, which is really amazing. So what we have is we have the Book of Quint is now featured on um, the Kindle platform, on Apple iBooks, and on Google Play Books. And Google Play Store now has a Play Books app. The Book of Quint is featured over there. So for any e-readers, you have complete access to the Book of Quint there. Another gift I received, Hayden Wheeler over in England sent me the Total Film Magazine, the, the, the Christmas 2023 edition that features the Book of Quint in the book review section on page 100. That's over in the UK right now, and they gave a great four-star review to the Book of Quint. It was uh, excellent to see that, an actual physical copy of the magazine. I posted up the review on the Instagram over at Book of Quint over at Instagram.com. Now I actually have the hard copy. The actual magazine got sent to me. So uh, during Christmas with my family here, we opened it up and we were able to pass it around and actually see uh, the Book of Quint right there on the page. Very great to see, and I'm very grateful for the um, for the mention in Total Film Magazine which is an uh, inside, it's an industry insider magazine, which is a, and, and it's great to be at that level. Um, that's where we need to be. And let's see if we can hold the line there at that level. So thank you very much, Mr. Wheeler. What, what an excellent gift. We saw a jump in the needle. We saw a jump in the needle on Amazon US sales over the Christmas holiday. What happened is in the sales ranking over at Amazon, it has a live sales ranking. If you look up the book, you can actually see where it ranks Amongst the 3 million or so books in circulation at Amazon US, and the needle jumped quite a considerable amount because what was happening was over Christmas, families were getting together and there were gifts exchanged and people received the Book of Quint and that created some dialogue. So Jaws fans were out there talking and people just then got in line for the pre-order on the Book of Quint for the US rollout. That moved the needle, and what that's proving is that the novel has great word of mouth. Remember, there really is very little media going on here. It's just what we're doing here with the Jaws Obsession broadcast. And what you can do out there when you talk about the novel, what your experience is, or if you're anticipating it, it's great that we have, we're coming together as a Jaws community as different communities come together, different fan bases come together, and that what we're going to see now, that's where you have to be. You have to have that solid base if we're going to make this book go to the next level. And that's what's interesting here is that it's happening. Everyone out there is doing what they're supposed to do. They're excited. It's generating excitement. We have life in the Jaws universe. It's great to see this project now is three years and five months into reality. It took three years and five months to get to this point. We're not stopping. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. That's what's excellent. And everybody is charged up. Everybody's energized. Everybody who reads the book of Quint goes right out and starts talking about it and their experience within the pages. So we have concrete evidence of that if you look at some of those metrics that are coming in. With our domestic distributor here in North America, they're not solely focused on Amazon. So there's going to be other stores involved. We have seen Walmart. Well, walmart.com is now offering the Book of Quint at sale. And that's Walmart. That's not an independent dist distributor working through Walmart. We're moving into the territory where Walmart will be offering the Book of Quint. It will be rolled out in the U.S. So it's great to see all these different avenues. We have Barnes & Noble listing the Book of Quint. If you go to uh, the description of this broadcast, I'm going to have the link tree, as always, right in the description of this broadcast. You can click on that, go right over to all the different links to where you need to go, and be able to acquire yourself a copy of the Book of Quint. We've seen a number of them on eBay, eBay with all these different vendors and different bookshops that have uh, virtual stores on eBay selling the Book of Quint. Great to see. Uh, that's, that's what we need. We need it to be fully 
to make sure that everybody has access to the Book of Quint. That was the big goal for 2023. Uh, if you listen back to episode uh, 51, uh, what was that was probably the first episode of 2023. The, one of the goals was to make sure that the entire world has access to the Book of Quint. And here we are, the last show, 2023, everybody now has access to the Book of Quint. In fact, remember, everyone was supposed to have homework over since the last, since episode 73. Everyone was supposed to have homework to read the prologue to the Book of Quint. And that is still ongoing. I'm not going to hold everybody to it just yet, but you can go to Google. You just Google the Book of Quint, Ryan Daco, my name, Ryan Daco, and that will take you right to the preview that Google is offering a first 10 chapters preview. If you go to Amazon, if you have a Kindle, or if you have an Amazon account or the Kindle app, you can download the preview to the Book of Quint over at the uh, right off of Amazon, and that will give you the first 10 chapters to the book. That's including the prologue. So you can read the prologue as part of uh, the homework to do. But what's, what's interesting is that everybody has access to the entire world. And that was our goal for 2023. Started out with getting uh, what was the, the quest was to find an agent. And we signed with Agent Bill Pettit of the William Pettit Agency in Atlanta, Georgia. And from there, it was the development from book to screen. And there was a, a lot of work that went into that. The screenplay was generated. I wrote the screenplay for the Book of Quint. And now there, there is a, so there is a first draft out there. Then there was the quest for publication. And as you've all followed along, the historic uh, uh, West Houghton meetup for the, at the Robert Shaw, where we, don't, where we donated uh, 12 hardcover novels of the Book of Quint from the limited edition run from the Indiegogo campaign to the libraries in West Houghton, UK, Robert Shaw's hometown, Robert Shaw's birthplace. And that led to Amberly Publishing, Dave Bowen, Nick Hayward, the CEO. We signed with Amberly Publishing, and that led us to the publication of the UK publication and uh, saw it released over into Europe and Australia and all around the world on November 15th. And here we are, 2024, where the, everybody has access now to the Book of Quint and it's going to be full-on released in January 23rd, 2024. How exciting is that? So there it is. Major hurdle has been crossed for this year, and now we have new hurdles to cross for 2024. And we'll have to we'll have to contemplate and 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 strategize on those, but that's what that's just what we're doing here. We're just keep moving forward just like a shark. Left, right, left, right keep moving forward. And then the, and always there's always forward progress, forward progression, just like a shark. Never go backwards, never stop. The reviews have been exquisite for the Book of Quint, and I'm very grateful for them. They're showing up on Amazon US, Amazon UK. Uh, Amazon is supposed to share the reviews. So if you post a review in the UK, it's supposed to be posted over here in the US. But I'm noticing there's some lag time. But I see every, I, I always check both and I see all the different reviews, but it's great to see all the different reviews coming in. Five-star reviews across the board. So thankful for them. And we had Brian D wrote a review. He said the book was written by a Jaws fan and an avid researcher. Only someone with this amount of love for the film could write such a wonderful story for the character of Quint. The book is a joy to read. It is gripping. And that, uh, and that was from Brian D. We had uh, other reviews. We had Steve wrote, Steve left a review on Amazon. Must read for Jaws fans. Having been a long time listener and early backer of the Book of Quint, it was everything I hoped it would be. Ryan has channeled his clear love of all things Jaws and tapped into his wealth of seafaring knowledge to write a classy, enjoyable story, which is an outstanding new entry to the Jaws universe. Thank you very much, Steve, for that five-star review. Sarah, Sarah comes in with a five-star review. Spectacular. I am a lifelong Jaws fan. When I began listening to the Jaws obsession, I was taken in completely. Ryan's knowledge and easy voice is a joy. When the book was in its infancy, I thought, oh, no, 
I'm not going to be able to read this as it's not going to be the same as Benchley. How wrong was I? I was one of the first to purchase one of the original copies when it came out. And when it came, I was so apprehensive about reading it. When I did, I read it so quickly that it blew me away. I have read all my life, both professionally and for pleasure. And this book is up there with the best. Ryan, what an author, and it's his first right. Come on, Universal, make this into a film for the 50th anniversary of Jaws. Yes, Sarah, totally agree. Thank you so much for that spectacular five-star review on Amazon.com. Wow, that's great. Yes, see, Sarah's seeing it would make a good movie. How about that? Hello, Universal. Hello, Universal. Can you hear the readers? Can you hear the Jaws fans out there? There is a demand for the Book of Quint to hit the silver screen with the original Jaws in 2025. What an experience that would be. That would be a great experience. An unnamed Amazon customer writes in and says, five-star review, verified purchase, deserves to sell as many copies as Jaws did. They write, what a fantastic book, utterly enthralling from start to finish. For a Jaws nerd like me, this fills in so many blanks and colors so much of Quint's pre-74 history, pre-1974 history. One-liners and fleeting references delivered by Quint in the original film are fleshed out and portrayed in lurid and captivating storytelling. I wish I could go back and read it for the first time again. This book delivers on every level, and if you're anything like me, will make you love and appreciate Jaws even more, if that's possible. Good on you, Mr. Daco. You have delivered a masterpiece. Well, thank you so much to thank you so much to this reviewer who left that great five-star review on Amazon. Says it's I wish I could go back and read it for the first time again. Now, that is a great compliment. That is something if, as a writer. Gosh, I that that you you can't you, you can't beat that. You can, I can't be more uh, humbled by hearing sentences like that when um I was right at this terminal right here working tapping away so much of that time um writing and uh, just feeling the story and the story's just pouring out. Very humbling and I'm very grateful. It's just because no matter what you write, it doesn't matter what you write without the reader it, the writer's job really is never complete. And that's what's so important here is that the readers are able to have access to the story. It's something we always wanted. And it was something that had to the patience that everyone showed waiting and waiting. And I know in this day and age where we have instant gratification with uh, on-demand movies and TV series and just the way our lives are nowadays, that this was something that had to be cultivated, it had to be presented, and it had to be held in order to get to this point, to be traditionally published, to be right up there, traditionally published, to actually make an official release into the Jaws universe. It's very exciting to see. I'm so thankful for everyone that sat in the box and hung in there and waited to see what all the hubbub. What is this guy talking about on this podcast over and over and over again? What could possibly be in this book that he's talking about? And here we are. It's awesome. What, what, a, what, a, what a, and it's not the end. It's not the end of the line. It's just that we're right here and it's exciting to see. I wanted to get one message here in before we move on to the Matt Hooper information. Left me speechless was I had a message on Instagram over at Book of Quint. You can message me there too. You can write me at the show here at jawsob2025 at gmail.com. Website is jawsob.com. You can see all that links in the description of the broadcast. But right here, uh, a gentleman, Jason, uh, messaged me through Instagram. What he wanted to say, he said, Ryan, I've read through the Book of Quint twice because I wanted to make sure that I had taken it all in. At the risk of sounding like a sycophant, the story was pitch perfect. I first saw Jaws after about eight months of begging my parents in the spring of 1976. Over the years, I saw it many times with my mom in the theaters. She passed away in 2019, and I had purchased her a second Kindle a couple of months earlier. I had never been able to pick that Kindle up until I got your book. 
It just seemed right to read the book of Quint with her Kindle. Thank you for giving me the perfect content to pick it up again. Jason, I, I wrote back to Jason about how uh, words can't express how much it means to know the book was able to bring him closer to the memory of his mom. And that those are that is what I'm seeing here from the messages that I'm seeing that there is that readers are developing an emotional connection to the events in the novel, that they are emotionally connected to the characters. And that is that is something that was never expected when I started this. I was knew I was going to tell a story. I did not understand how that story was going to come out. I just knew it was there. I could see it, but as now it is out in the novel, I'm seeing an emotional connection that different readers are attaching different experiences to it. And it's fascinating to me to see as it goes out there, everybody will have different reactions to it because the perception is the sum of the perception that you read a novel is the sum of your life experiences. I found that I just find that fascinating and I'm learning that in real time here as I see these messages come in and I couldn't thank Jason enough for uh, sharing with me that how close he was that what what the book meant to him in those respects and for him to say it was pitch perfect that was that's an extreme compliment right there in that it is the the novel itself is like a symphony you are composing at the same with words and you can't have too much action, you lose the reader. Too much, uh, too much drama, and you lose the reader. So you're, it's a constant ebb and flow. And how can you navigate those waters? That is the, what I was thinking about this whole time while writing. And, and the, the, while writing it, that was always a constant a drumbeat in my mind. The composition of the events and how it was going to flow. And for him to say it was pitch perfect, I always use that term, if you heard me in earlier interviews, walking a tightrope. Too much and you fall off on one side. Too much to this side, you're going to fall off. You have to stay on that tightrope. Many factors that I had to consider while doing that. And so to see, to hear the term pitch perfect from a review from a reader, it means the world to me. And I want to thank you, Jason, for sharing with me that message on Instagram. Thank you. And these reviews always help us when they go out over Amazon, Goodreads, or at Barnes & Noble, or over at Waterstones. There's so many different places to leave reviews now, but those reviews help the first impression of the novel when someone encounters it. If someone has recommended the book, they go right to the reviews. It's just natural. You go right there. So when they see a wall of five-star reviews and some very heartfelt emotional responses... That helps. That really does help. So you have power here. You are in control. You have the power here to really advance this novel into the future. It's great to see the community coming together, the Jaws fans coming together and, and sharing personal experiences of when they saw the original movie and how this novel does that justice. Very exciting. Thank you very much for all of that. Now let's get ahead to Matt Hooper. Let's talk about territoriality. We've always prided ourselves on the Jaws obsession is to break down certain aspects of the film. And I wanted to do this. This was uh, this is one of the ones that I wanted to get to, but I felt that what happened was I had I have a couple of pieces of literature here. I have two If you remember the scene in Jaws when uh Oh, oh, oh god. You scared me. Oh. Uh. You know, Alan, people don't even know how old sharks are. I mean, if they live two, three thousand years. I find all that interesting is that there's uh, a, many fans have paused this this scene and they've analyzed what actually what books that Martin Brody has on his desk there that he's reading to research sharks. So in order to get through this next segment, I have three books here from pre Jaws pre Jaws shark books that have information that was available to Matt Hooper at the time. That's what Martin Brody's reading here. So these were the top-of-the-line shark scientific uh, books that were available. And one of the books that's right there on, on the desktop was a gift that I received from my sister Kalina over Christmas. 
she brought to me an antique book from a uh, fr- that she found on Cape Cod. It was called The Shark, Splendid Savage of the Sea by Jacques Cousteau and Philippe Cousteau. Uh, this is a book published by Doubleday and Company in 1970. Very interesting because Doubleday was the uh, that the company that would move would go on to publish Jaws, the hardcover. The next the next book that I have here was the gift from a friend of the show, Andy Curry, Andrew Curry, that I received in July first, two thousand twenty three, um, when I visited England. It's called Sharks: Unpredictable Killer of the Sea by Thomas Helm. That's another uh, old style shark book uh, from nineteen sixty one. Now, if you go back and listen to Jaws Obsession, episode 64, Quint Inspiration, we had a visitor on the show, Dan Carver, that spotlighted this book on the show. And we found out, we actually, we stumbled upon that this book was part of the inspiration to the uh, USS Indianapolis speech that as it was finally written and performed by Robert Shaw in the movie Jaws. So we go into this book in great detail in episode 64. I'm going to go into a little bit more in detail coming up shortly here. And finally, I have the National Geographic February 1968 issue that has a feature called Sharks, Wolves of the Sea by Nathaniel T. Kenny uh, that starts on page 222. And some of these images that are in Jaws when uh, Martin Brody is flipping through the books and some of the imagery that they filmed for the movie Jaws are from this issue of National Geographic from the February 1968 issue, volume 133, number two. So volume 133, number two. I have that here as well, and we're going to be diving into that. Those are the three pre-Jaws publications that we're going to be using here in order to kind of get into Matt Hooper's head, figure out what's going on here. So I wanted to start with the dinner sequence here. My husband tells me you're in sharks. (laughs) Excuse me. Well, yes, I've never heard it quite put that way, but uh, yes, I am. I love sharks. You love sharks. Yeah, I love them. I love them. Let's start right out there is that Matt Hooper, the rock star marine biologist, That was the iconic role that every kid back then decided they wanted to be a shark scientist or a shark researcher. This role right here performed by Richard Dreyfuss, it's cited as for many reasons. If you talk to Andy Casagrande, if you talk to many of these uh, people that are working today in modern shark research, you see on the Discovery Channel on Shark Week, they will cite Jaws as that inspiration for them to study sharks and to work for shark conservation. Personally, I wanted to get into scuba diving because of this role from Jaws. He made scuba diving cool in my, and in, 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 this was like in, in a movie. It was, it was just, it was something that I never saw before. You know, it wasn't just a creature from the Black Lagoon. It was someone that was diving with a purpose that they wanted to actually, they were researching. And what he says here, so he says, I love sharks. I love them. Uh, yes, I am. I love sharks. You love sharks. Yeah, I love them. I love them. <laughs> and that's very interesting is that he's coming right from a, of, that a lot of people bag on Jaws, um, especially in the recent uh, couple years. Uh, Jaws has kind of gotten a hex on it. And, you know, with the, what we, had, we highlighted earlier with Steven Spielberg, he apologized to the sharks. And that Peter Benchley always had this. He wore the burden on their back for creating an anti-shark hysteria. But what we have here is we have a character that proclaims his love for sharks. And I don't think that has ever been done before in movies up until this point. That this was the first movie where a character actually says, I love sharks. That was so taboo back in 1974 when this was filmed, 75 when it was released. That was so odd, and it was it was odd even into the 80s to the point where even my third grade teacher thought it was just very odd that I was always drawing sharks and that I my favorite animal was a shark. She thought that was very violent because sharks had that stigma attached to them. But here we have, if anyone can remind me, has there ever been, was there any movie before then where someone proclaimed their love for sharks? There wasn't. Jaws was the first. And that's very interesting here, and it's always overlooked. So that's, we want to focus on that. We want to focus on what Matt Hooper was coming at 
his approach to sharks was out of love and respect. We do know that because what? how does he describe the great white later on? I need to see you. I'm begging you. I'm more than God, damn it. Come here, darling. Come here, darling. Beautiful. So he says, come here, darling. Beautiful. So he's taking pictures of the great white that we have grown to be afraid of. And this was this movie, obviously it's terrorizing the, the swimmers and it's, it's a man eater. And yet he's saying, come here, darling, you're beautiful. And he's taking photos. And so we have Matt Hooper comes at, we have to look at what he's doing is he's coming onto the Island of Amity out of, uh, w- with love for sharks. Very, very interesting. And I don't think that is highlighted enough. That's what we're going to be doing here. We're going to be highlighting this because he, just by saying that he is groundbreaking from the conventional wisdom of the time. And that's what we're going to look up in these books coming up here. I love sharks. You love sharks. Yeah, I love them. I love them. When I was 12 years old, my father got me this boat, and I went fishing off of Cape Cod, and I hooked a scup, and as I was reeling it in, I hooked a four-and-a-half-foot baby thresher shark who proceeded to eat my boat. <laughs> he ate my uh, oar hooks and uh, my seat cushions. He turned an inboard into an outboard, scared me to death, <laughs> and I swam back to shore. And when I was on the beach... I turned around and I actually saw my boat being taken apart. And ever since then, I, yes, I have been studying sharks. And that's why I know that uh, I'm going to go to the Institute tomorrow and tell them that you still have a shark problem here. Back on episode 36, the Jaws Obsession, episode 36, Father and Son Dynamic, with Matt Hooper's history here about him and his father. One thing that uh, you'll see in the prologue to the Book of Quint is that it establishes a certain fact uh, that that Matt Hooper's uh, father was lost at sea in a boating accident and what they called a boating accident. Could that be why he is so perturbed by when they tried to say Chrissy Watkins died of a boating accident? And that is, it's very interesting. When you add that dynamic into the equation, it actually explains why he is so aggressive in that autopsy scene. But that's uh, for another episode. But we're going to stick on this with this little story that he tells here. Let's break this down a little bit. When I was 12 years old, my father got me this boat, and I went fishing off of Cape Cod, and I hooked a scup, and as I was reeling it in, I hooked a four-and-a-half-foot baby thresher shark. Okay, he hooked a a four-and-a-half-foot baby thresher shark. Who proceeded to eat my boat. (laughs) He ate my uh, oar hooks and uh, my seat cushions. He turned an inboard into an outboard, scared me to death, (laughs) and I swam back to shore. That is very unusual behavior for a thresher shark. Thresher sharks are usually solitary creatures that keep to themselves. It is known that thresher populations of the Indian Ocean are separated by depth and space. Uh, Some species, however, do occasionally hunt in a group of two or three, contrary to their solitary nature. All species are noted for their highly migratory habits. The, The elongated tail is used to swat smaller fish, stunning them before feeding. Sometimes the thresher shark will slice the fish in half before eating. Thresher sharks are one of the few shark species known to fully jump out to jump fully out of the water using their elongated tail to propel them out of the water making turns like dolphins this behavior is called breaching so what we're looking at here is we're going to dive into the jaws universe here is that the thresher shark is sort of it's been widely known as being a skittish shark solitary stays away matt hooper hooked a scup which is a type of fish S-C-U-P, that occurs primarily in the Atlantic from Massachusetts to South Carolina. His story is he has this fish on the line, thresher shark comes in to take it, and then decides to attack his boat. Very unusual. So if we dive into the Jaws universe, we're not doubting Matt Hooper's talk. He knows it was a thresher. Obviously, it's hard to deny what a thresher looks like because of the length of its tail. And we can't deny that the thresher attacked his boat and took it apart, and he was fascinated ever since. But what was making the thresher act so aggressively around the Cape Cod area where Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket and Amity Island are located? That is what's interesting. That's what, And that is one of the conditions, the shark behaviors we're already, by just this story, we're already establishing that there are different shark behaviors in the Jaws universe in this area of the ocean. What was that reason? So this is the first hint that there is something else happening 
inside the Jaws universe that makes a thresher behave aggressively, over aggressively. That's what's very interesting. So, but Matt Hooper is thinking that this is how a normal thresher behaves, maybe, because that's his experience with just a thresher shark. So maybe he thinks threshers are like that all around the world. That is what we're doing here is we're trying to look at Matt Hooper's point of view at the time inside the Jaws universe during the summer of 1974. We do know this is the summer of 1974 because the Brody kitchen calendar, the wall calendar is 1974. So very interesting. So let's stay inside Matt Hooper's point of view here. They caught a shark, not the shark. Not the shark that killed Chrissy Watkins and probably not the shark that killed the little boy, which I wanted to prove today by cutting the shark open. But, you, you know, you want to let that breathe for nothing, nothing. So it's very important, this line here. You know, uh, you're going to be the only rational man left on this island after I leave tomorrow. Where are you going? Uh, I am going on the Aurora. The Aurora? What is that? It's a floating asylum for uh, shark <laughs> uh, fanatics. Uh, pure research, 18 months at sea. So he's going on the Aurora... She asked, what's that? It's a floating asylum for shark addicts, pure research, 18 months at sea. So it's a year and a half that he was going to go on this vessel called the Aurora for shark research. Now, this is all very interesting, is that what was he going to be doing for 18 months at sea for a year and a half, and he was going to be leaving? So let's all keep that in mind. He's going to be going on the Aurora 18 months at sea. Is it true that most people get attacked by sharks in three feet of water, about 10 feet from the beach. Yeah. And that and, and before people started to swim for recreation, I mean, before sharks knew what they were missing, that a lot of these attacks weren't reported. That's right. So right there, Martin Brody is actually citing Shark Unpredictable Killer of the Sea by Thomas Helm, a book from 1961, on page 64, Thomas Helm writes, Fatal shark attacks have often been known to occur in water less than three feet deep, so shallow water is not a safety factor. What, what I'm doing here is I'm just citing conventional wisdom, that this is all matching up in conventional wisdom about shark attacks and when shark attacks occur. They move on to talk about the rogue shark theory. Now this shark that, that, that swims alone, rogue. what's it called? Rogue. 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 This guy, he, he keeps swimming around in a place where the feeding is good until the food supply is gone, right? It's called territoriality. It's just theory that I happen to agree with. He says it's territoriality is just a theory that he happens to agree with. In the same book by Thomas Helm, over back on page 56, we do know that this book was on the set of Jaws when they were writing the screenplay because the screenplay was being written daily. So Carl Gottlieb cites this book, um, and this was information brought to us by Dan Carver. That Carl Gottlieb cites this book as one of the references that he was using when he was writing some of these extra scenes. It says here on page 56, it says, The third type of attack is one made by the rogue or confirmed man-eater. Whether certain sharks, like certain tigers, develop a taste for human flesh has not yet been positively determined and probably never will be. There is, however, good reason to suspect that such sharks do exist. On occasions far too numerous to ignore, there has been a series of attacks in given areas, and when notes are compared, it is obvious that at least the same type and size shark was responsible. And that's where you get a mention of rogue. Another mention of the rogue shark theory, and one of the things that, that he, he mentions about the man-eating tiger, he cites uh, back on page 52, he says uh, in the book titled Man-Eaters of Kuman, Major Jim Corbett described a man-eating tiger as one compelled through stress of circumstance beyond its control to adopt an alien diet. This stress, Corbett said, might be caused by wounds, old age, or both. Once tasting human flesh and realizing how easy it is to obtain, he continues the tiger uh, uh, to obtain the tiger forsakes natural natural prey and concentrates on humans. So what this author was saying was that the rogue theory is based on the man-eating tiger uh, experiences that uh, were coming out of Africa. One of the other examples was the Ghost and the Darkness film 
from 1996, and that was starring Michael Douglas and Val Kilmer. I don't know if anyone remembers that film, but that was from a real-life incident. The Ghost in the Darkness um, was based on fact. There was a bridge being built in uh, Kenya in 1898, 1898, and there were two man-eating lions there who killed 130 people for no reason. And these two gentlemen were brought in to find the lions and kill the lions that were terrorizing the village there. That was a historic fact as well. So what this rogue theory was doing at the time, well, it was it was building off of this. And then, of course, the famous, the infamous New Jersey incident. We're going to get to Maneater in a little bit because Maneater was a term that was used a lot in Jaws, in shark literature back in the 60s and 70s. So I, what I want to do is I want to flip over to the February 1968 issue of National Geographic. Now we know Martin Brody was flipping through this issue because of the pictures that are shown right before the holiday roast doc sequence. He's flipping through this issue of National Geographic because they, they highlight some of the photos that are in this. So in February 1968, the article, it mentions, what triggers a shark attack? One of the puzzles facing experts is why a shark in one part of the world harasses humans while its brother of the same species in another place does not. The late Dr. V.M. Coppelson an Australian authority thought water temperature was one factor. Most attacks occur, he concluded, above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Great white sharks, however, have attacked California divers in 55 degree temperatures, and the Greenland shark, as well as the northern poor beagle, feeds in even colder water. Dr. Coppelson also believed multiple shark attacks in an area could be the work of a single rogue, the marine parallel of the Indian tiger that has acquired a taste for human flesh. Stuart Springer, on the other hand, feels the entire shark population living in less than ideal natural conditions may be dangerous to man. They say principal populations of sharks establish themselves quite naturally in areas where food is abundant and other conditions are good. Stuart said the area may be large. Some species of sharks migrate over regular ranges like African big game. Around the edge of the principal area, you will find an, a, an accessory population that includes congenital weak, weaklings, cripples, or possibly neurotics, all of them animals th that can't compete with the others and drift away from them. Life is harder for these peripheral sharks, and they may be the dangerous ones. As you might expect, they take whatever food comes along. This could be man. Now, this is a little far-fetched with conventional wisdom of shark behavior. But at the time, in, in National Geographic, February 1968, they're, not, they're talking about the rogue shark theory by Dr. V.M. Coppelson. Now, that's what I think, that's who I believe Matt Hooper is citing when he says territoriality. It's just a theory I happen to agree with. Right, it's called territoriality. It's just a theory that I happen to agree with. So there it is. There's the territoriality theory. And I believe the rogue, when he talks about rogue, he's talking about this Dr. V.M. Coppelson, whose theory of the single rogue shark um, would be responsible for multiple shark attacks in an area. Another reason, and I'm going to stay with this National Geographic issue from 1968, Another reason why they, that leads them back then, shark scientists were leaning towards rogue sharks. A town in Australia tried to, Durban, in Australia, Durban tried to solve the shark problem with strong fences completely enclosing the city beaches. Uh, they worked, but they were prohibitively expensive, both to build and to maintain in the heavy Indian Ocean surf, and were eventually abandoned. In 1952, the city engineers turned to a system of meshing already in use with apparent success in Australia, whose beaches had the world's worst record of shark attacks. To mesh a beach, you simply anchor gill nets at intervals off the shore. During the first year, the nets at Durban took 552 sharks. Since then, the catch has dropped to less than 110 a year. In seven years before the nets were used, the city had 10 sure attacks, seven of them fatal, and at least 10 probables. After meshing, there were no attacks until 1965, when a surfer suffered a minor bite on one thigh. 
So it's very interesting. What I'm seeing here is that in this National Geographic, they were also talking about sharks off Hawaiian beaches are also appeared to be non-migratory. Last year, under Dr. Tester's direction, the 50th state opened a three-year campaign to eradicate them so far as possible, using set lines with hooks at 60-foot intervals. One of the first results was a noticeable decrease in concentration of large tigers off Honolulu Harbor. So what this serves is, is that the conventional wisdom was non-migratory sharks, and it was trying to either, they, they, in Australia, they were using mesh and fencing in order to keep the sharks away or to kill the sharks. And then even in Hawaii, they actually had a, a campaign, a three-year campaign to eradicate large tiger sharks to make the beaches safer. Now, this is all in the February issue of 1968. So this is, this is seven years before Jaws is even released in screens. So I want... I'm not what I'm what what I would like to highlight here is that Jaws, yes, did paint a negative light on sharks, but that wasn't the first to be done. That the sharks were already being thought of as a nuisance and thought of to be eradicated around swimming areas well before Jaws was even made. And that is a very important point going forward here. And I'm not we're not trying to exonerate Jaws, but we're coming to the defense of Jaws. In a way, there was definitely man versus shark violence going on that existed long before 1974, 1975. What I'm trying to highlight here is that Matt Hooper, talking about rogue shark theories and territoriality, he's coming at it with a state of love and respect for the shark. He's trying to understand the behavior of the shark. And I think Matt Hooper, he was on the cusp of breaking out and actually showing that sharks were not the man-eaters that, that they are thought to be. He would be one of those scientists that would actually go on. That was what the Aurora was going to be. Is The Aurora is going to be that 18 months research at sea in order to prove that sharks are migratory that the and even the non-migratory sharks do not have a taste for human flesh. And I want to keep going here. What I want to do is a skip ahead to the billboard sequence. This is a great white, Larry. A big one. And any shark expert in the world will tell you it's a killer. It's a man-eater. Look, the situation is that apparently a great white shark has staked a claim in the waters off Amity Island. And he is going to continue to feed here as long as there is food in the water. And, and there's no limit to what he's going to do. I mean, we've already had three incidents. Two people killed inside of a week, and it's going to happen again. It happened before. The Jersey Beach. 1916, 1916 there were five people chewed up in the surf. In tell one him, week. Tell him about the swimmers. He says it's a killer, it's a man-eater. What Martin Brody and, and Matt Hooper does not dispute that, because it was conventionally the Great White was termed as a man-eater in scientific journals and scientific books back then. What I have here now is I'm going to stick on this National Geographic 1968. The uh, term man-eater, it says uh, over on page 238, of the species known at present, only a handful can be listed as proven eaters of man. Against some of these, there is the incontrovertible evidence of human remains found in stomachs, teeth left in wounds of victims, and eyewitness identification by unimpeachable experts. Against other stands, stands the strongest kind of circumstantial evidence, including the characteristics of wounds and the proven presence of the shark species at the scene of the attack. Every list is of proven man-eaters agrees on nine sharks. These are the Great White, which also bears the name, quote, man-eater, Mako, Bull, Lemon, Tiger, Dusky, Blue, the largest, the largest hammerheads, and the white tip, a pelagic shark, meaning one that dwells at or near the surface of the open seas away from land. All these sharks have attacked living humans as well as corpses. And that is the, uh, talking about the oceanic white tip shark, which is what the shark that the Book of Quint highlights that was stalking the men that were in the water after the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Uh, What is interesting is on page 239 of this issue is the famous painting that Ellen Brody Sites when she says, uh, when she tells Michael to get out of the water. And I want him to read the boating regulations, the rules, you know, before he goes out on his own. Michael, did you hear your father out of the water now? Now! That scene, that painting that she looks at, 
That's a very interesting painting. If you listen to the description here, it says, Real life Moby Dick, a great white shark matches the fury of fiction's famous whale in a sudden attack off Canada's Cape Breton Island. Seas swamped the splintered dory of two lobstermen, one of them drowned, and the other clung to the wreckage until rescued, apparently scorning them. The animal swam away to seek a meal elsewhere. This painting recreates the harrowing experience of John McLeod, who survived, and John Burns, who died on the summer morning in 1953. A tooth embedded in the battered boat identified the species. The shark's length was estimated at about 12 feet, and it weighed probably, and its weight probably exceeded 1,000 pounds. Mr. McLeod still fishes the same North Atlantic waters. So it actually, the description of what this what what um of the event well this uh, great white attacked this boat that she saw the painting of they're saying that there actually a tooth was found embedded in the hull and that is what we see happen with in jaws with ben gardner's boat where matt hooper finds the triangular tooth in the hull of the derelict boat very interesting how this one issue of national geographic february 1968 might have inspired a lot of these events that we see in Jaws that were not necessarily from the novel Jaws Peter, uh, by Peter Benchley. Then over on page 243, in 1916, a shark or sharks attacked five swimmers along the New Jersey coast. Four died of savage injuries. The fifth lost a leg. There was panic and publicity. Shortly afterward, a fisherman caught a great white shark with human remains in its stomach. Sharks of several species charge boats with disconcerting frequency. In the best documented Nova Scotia attack, a shark swamped a dory off Fort Chu in the splintered wood around an eight-inch hole in the dory was part of a shark tooth, the unmistakable serrated triangular tooth of a great white. But it describes the great white here. It says, large or small, fast or slow, peaceful or aggressive, every shark and every other marine creature as well gives sea room to one member of the family, the great white shark or man eater. So that's from National Geographic, and that's what Martin Brody was citing when he says, we've got a great white, a man eater. This is a great white, Larry, a big one. And any shark expert in the world will tell you it's a killer, it's a man eater. Look, the situation is that apparently a great white shark has staked a claim in the waters off Amity Island. A lot of people always talk about why didn't Matt Hooper step in and he didn't say, hey, great whites don't behave like this. We have to realize that at the time, shark literature, as we're proving on this episode 74, shark literature was discussing great whites as man eaters. And this was just conventional wisdom at the time. And he is going to continue to feed here as long as there is food in the water. And there's no limit to what he's going to do. I mean, we've already had three incidents. Two people killed inside of a week, and it's going to happen again. It happened before. The Jersey Beach. 1916, there were five, five people, people chewed up in the surf. In tell one them, week. Tell them about the swimmers. A shark is attracted to the exact kind of splashing and activity that occurs whenever human beings go in swimming. You cannot avoid it. Very interesting in the same National Geographic. I'm going to stay with that. We saw the graphic earlier that it highlights when it shows the erratic impulses of the fish in distress and the shark sensing it. But in that description right underneath that, that's not shown in the film. It says right here, it says, Sounds made by a wounded fish, similar to the thrashing of a human swimmer, swimmer in trouble, can attract a shark from as far as 300 yards away. The, the erratic, low-frequency vibrations trigger sensitive hair cells in fluid-filled canals just beneath the skin located on both sides of the body. That's the lateral line of the shark. The cells flash messages to the brain, ignoring healthier fish. The animal streaks toward the more vulnerable prey because a, a, a healthier fish has a smooth rhythm, rhythmic pulses and it's going to go at the fish in distress. And that's what they're saying is that similar to the thrashing of human swimmers in trouble. That's what Matt Hooper's citing here. He's not citing anything that's not in the National Geographic. And even Mayor Vaughn, Larry Vaughn, has probably read the same National Geographic because we know he has a little bit of information about sharks, don't we? If you open the beaches on the 4th of July, it's like ringing the dinner bell, for Christ's sake. Look, sakes. Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the wreck hull of a boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. It was Ben Gardner's boat. It was all chewed up. I helped throw it in. You, sh you should have seen him. Where, where is that tooth? Did you see it, Broad? No, I didn't see it. He, he dropped it. I had an accident. Way in. 
And what did you say the name of this shark is? It's a Carcharodon carcarius. It's a great white. But you, you don't have the tooth. If you look at, uh, go back to episode 38 of the Jaws Obsession, it's all psychological. Uh, we break the scene down really well. There, this, uh, there, there's a lot more going on here that the mayor is, he's, he's basically uh, has a facade up right here. He knows exactly what a great white tooth looks like. He knows exactly what the, what a great white would mean on the headlines. And uh, he's not having any of it, but he's not telling Matt Hooper and he's not telling chief Brody that that's what I wanted to take away here was the book of Quint establishes a baseline of facts and conditions that Hooper was unaware of at the time. That's what the book of Quint shows, that there is a history to Amity Island here that had Matt Hooper been aware of it, that changes the entire dynamic of these theories. The book of Quint is now working its way into how we interpret these scenes. After reading that, you are going to now see that Matt Hooper is, he is in the dark. There was a reason why that thresher shark was unusually aggressive, but Matt Hooper doesn't know it. And that's what the Book of Quint establishes. One of the things I wanted to show was that Matt Hooper was headed, he was headed to go research sharks. Uh, mainly he was going to be researching great white migration patterns. That's my theory here. And that is because if you listen to his description of the Aurora. It's a floating asylum for uh, shark uh, <laughs> fanatics. Uh, pure research, 18 months at sea. Pure research, 18 months at sea. He was supposed to be leaving the next day, right? You know, uh, you're going to be the only rational man left on this island after I leave tomorrow. So he was going to leave tomorrow to go to wherever the Aurora is. Now, I believe the Aurora, the Aurora is in Australia. The clues that I have now is we have to go forward to Matt Hooper talking on the phone during the tourist invasion on the 4th of July. There is one line that gets sent out there. But hugging me, the doctor, shore, there is no need for me to come to Brisbane when I have shore. a great white shark right here. here. Right here. There is no need for me to go to Brisbane when I have a great white shark right here. So he's making this call there. Hugging me, the doctor, shore, there, there is no need for me to come to Brisbane when shore. I have a great white shark right here. here. So he's talking to a doctor. And he's saying there's no need to go to Brisbane when I have a great white shark right here. Is this the head of the research team that's the Aurora? Is this the head that's going to be going that that the doctor, is he talking to the head of the research team that he's basically saying, can you hold off for a few more weeks? I can't get down there because I have a great white shark right here. There's no need for me to go to Brisbane just yet. So that tells me that that's what he was going to be doing on the Aurora. He was going to be going to, Matt Hooper was going to be going to investigate and study great white migration patterns. That's the only reason why you'd be at sea for 18 months. You were going to be sailing from one end of the ocean to the other. You would be going from Australia, Brisbane, Australia. Then you were going to be going all the way probably over to South Africa, crossing the Indian Ocean and then going to South Africa, studying the Great Whites off of South Africa. It's so interesting, that one throwaway line right there is kind of telling you that Matt Hooper was on to something here. That's one of the takeaways from this episode, is you have to look at that Matt Hooper was ready to break out of this pre-1974 thought that sharks were man-eaters, and they were, uh, that some were rogue hunters of man. They just went and stalked a place until they depleted the food. If there were no more swimmers, then the shark would move on. I think Mr. Hooper was actually going to be doing some amazing research and breaking out of that. Why? Because he was coming at it with a sense of love for sharks. He loves sharks. I love sharks. You love sharks. Yeah, I love them. I love them. <laughs> That's so important there is that that's what he was looking at, this love and respect for the sharks that you 
typically did not see from some of these books and magazines that were released back in the 60s and 70s. So as we bring it on home here on episode 74, I have one more book that I wanted to get to. I'm starting to draw some conclusions here. I did not start this episode with any preconceived notions, but we're starting to see a pattern here in in some of this historic literature that I have here, shark books, shark-based scientific books, pre-1974. So we have uh, The Shark, Splendid Savages of the Sea by Jacques Cousteau and Philippe Cousteau. As I said before, this is from 1970, published by Doubleday down in New York City. This is sitting on top of the desk. We don't really see it, but when Martin Brody grabs the book, uh, as he says... You know, Alan, people don't even know how old sharks are. I mean, if they live two, three thousand years. He grabs a book and he brings it down. The book that's on top that you see, that's this book, The Shark, Splendid Savage of the Sea. We have to look at Jacques Cousteau and his son, Philippe Cousteau, at the time in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, were the authority. That is where you went to for knowledge about the sea, the open ocean, and the animals that inhabit it. And they had a number of documentaries, a number of books, and, and they were featured everywhere. So this book here, hardcover, uh, Doubleday book here, is quite the volume, is quite the source on uh, observational knowledge of sharks and shark behavior. One of the, thi- one of the topics that this, uh, this book tries to tackle is how can man live with shark and how can we keep men safe from sharks because they were, um, they, he talks. They talk about how there was a study. They they were doing studies after World War II with a number of shark attacks. Uh, they don't name any specific ones, but obviously the USS Indianapolis incident was one of them. That the government, the U.S. government, and other governments around the world were trying to figure out a way to keep their sailors, uh, airmen and soldiers safe should they be stranded out at sea. And is there an effective shark repellents that could be invented? And uh, Jacques Cousteau and his son Philippe Cousteau were right at the forefront of uh, of those studies. So one thing that's interesting here is I wanted to read an excerpt from chapter one. It's called First Encounter, a meeting with a a meeting with a great blue shark. Uh, this is the, the, so. This this book has uh, both narratives are written by. Uh, s- sometimes it's Philippe the son. Sometimes it's Jacques the father. Right here, Philippe writes about an experience he had and his observations with a blue shark in the open ocean. So let's read what Philippe Cousteau says. He writes here in the Shark Splendid Savage of the Sea, Chapter One. His entire form is fluid. Weaving from side to side, his head moves slowly from left to right, right to left, timed to the rhythm of his motion through the water. Only the eye is fixed, focused on me, circling within the orbit of the head. In order to not lose sight for a fraction of a second of his prey, or perhaps of his enemy, there is no threat, no movement of aggression. Only a sort of nonchalant suspicion is apparent in the movements and attitudes of the shark, and yet he generates fear. Amazed and startled, filled with apprehension, circling with it, with movements as slow and silent as possible, I try to keep him constantly in front of me. He turns once more, and the sphere he encompasses expands or contracts in accordance with his own primitive impulses or the subtle changes of the current. His silent circling is a ballet governed by untraceable mechanisms. The blue tranquility of his form surrounds me with the sensation of a web of murderous and yet beautiful force. His configuration is perfect. Suddenly, the idea that he deserves killing comes to me like a shock and instantly shatters the spell. Murder is the real function of this ideal form, of this icy blue camouflage, and of that enormous powerful tail. The water has returned to my consciousness, and I can, I can feel it again, gentle and flowing between my fingers solid against my palms. I am 110 feet below the surface in the clear, deep water of the Indian Ocean. With 30 minutes of air remaining and a camera in my hand, I am far from being an easy prey. Our circling has in fact gone on for only a few seconds. The great blue shark continues his approach towards me in the unchanging manner which has been that of his race throughout its existence. He is really a superb animal, almost 7 feet in length, and I know since I have often seen them before, that his jaw is lined with seven rows of teeth, as finely honed as the sharpest razor. I have already begun to ascend slowly towards the surface, simulating a few movements of attack whenever his orbit brings him sufficiently close. 
He perceives the slightest pressure wave from my smallest movement, analyzes every change in acidity or in the vaguest of odors, and he will never allow himself to be surprised by an abrupt movement. He can swim at a speed of more than 30 knots, and his attack would probably be impossible to parry. But he is still circling around me, making use of the cautiousness that has protected his species since its first appearance on this planet more than 100 million years ago. I know that the circles are growing inexorably smaller and that I will probably succeed in repelling his first attack, but I also know that this will not discourage him. Startled for a moment, he will resume the circle of hunger. His attacks will become more and more frequent, and in the end he will break through my feeble defense and his jaws will close on the first bite of my flesh. Drawn by invisible signals, other sharks of the open sea will appear, climbing from the lowest depths or slicing the surface with the knife of their dorsal fins. And then it will be the scramble for the spoils, a frenzy of hunger, of bloody and irresistible strength and horror, for this is the way of the great sharks of the open sea. That's a first-hand encounter with the blue shark in the open ocean, and that's from Philippe Cousteau, right there from chapter one of the book. So here you have a man who's generally comfortable in the water. And this is in the late 60s. This would be a late 60s that he would have been experiencing this. So uh, here you have a man who is generally comfortable in the water, has done thousands of dives to his name. His father is Jacques Cousteau, and even he has a fear or it, he has a cautious sense of what a shark can do in its domain in the open ocean. And what's interesting is that it sounds like he is un, he is not provoking the shark. There isn't any chum in the water or any, they're not attracting with bait fish. He's just in the ocean and the shark is doing its circling and the circles are getting smaller and smaller. And he knows that as it gets closer, that's when the attack is going to happen. Before I go into what I'm thinking there, what I also want to remind everyone is that, the, is that Matt Hooper would have read this book. This In the Jaws universe, this book is there on Martin Brody's desk. So this would have been one of the books that Matt Hooper would have gone through, would have read already four years ago when it first came out, because he is a shark scientist. So this is the type of literature that, and this is the type of data. Uh, there wasn't, uh, obviously, no, there wasn't an internet or any kind of uh, uh, chat groups or meetings back then. You really had what was published. And these are the type of published books out there. And these are the perceptions of what sharks were doing, firsthand accounts of how sharks were reacting in the wild. So you can see how Matt Hooper, using these type, this type of mindset that Philippe Cousteau had in this book, from this data, and then Matt Hooper's experience with the thresher shark, an aggressive thresher shark, and, uh, and really up to that point, we have to assume Matt Hooper's experiences were all from sharks around the North Atlantic especially around the Amity Island waters, in that triangle of waters between Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, Amity Island, and then if you go across to Cape Cod. So we know that Matt Hooper was raised in the Cape Cod area because his, he said he went fishing off of Cape Cod. His father got him a boat at 12 years old. So what we're looking at is that this is kind of leading into, in the Jaws universe, that Matt Hooper actually has the right instincts on how to react to sharks throughout the movie. Because we have to always put ourselves back into that mindset about how were sharks perceived back then. But this is very interesting, and I'm, I'm actually coming to a, another conclusion. Well, it's not really a conclusion, it's a question that I'm going to get to at the end of the episode here. But I wanted to read one more part. I know these are, these are a little bit longer, but these are fa this is fascinating stuff here. From page 23, Philippe Cousteau goes on to talk about his experience, uh, it, his experience with man versus shark and how man has perceived sharks throughout the centuries, throughout the decades. So on page 23, Philippe Cousteau goes on to write, There is a mystery attached to the relations between man and shark, and the stranger attitude is perhaps not that of the animal. For a very long period, man was ignorant of the existence of sharks, and until the middle of the 16th century, there was not even an English word to designate this species. The Spanish word tiburon was currently used to fill out this linguistic note it might be remarked that the French word for shark, requin, stems from requiem, the mass for the dead, reflecting sailors' fears of the appearance of this beast in the waters around them. Some even feared that sighting a shark presaged the death of a member of the crew. 
In antiquity, there is mention of sharks only in the writings of Herodotus, Aristotle, and Pliny. Pliny, in particular, went so far as to distinguish among four different species of sharks. Before these Greek writers, no, pre no precise mention of sharks is to be found, yet it may be that the first legend relating to the squalus is in the Bible. Linnaeus, the eminent 18th century Swedish naturalist, was convinced that the monster that swallowed Jonah was a great white shark and not a whale. And ever since the Bible, many, many other stories have been told of this fantastic animal, most of them horrible. These stories, true or false, have contributed toward creating a psychosis of the shark in all the sailors of the world, and even in the men who are simply interested in the sea without the slightest intention of ever going near it. Second in violence only to the monstrous fury of hungry sharks is the blind hatred of man for this species. I have watched and filmed scenes of carnage of implicable cruelty, in which normally quiet and reasonable men used axes to hack at the bodies of sharks they had caught, and then plunged their hands and arms into the blood streaming from the entrails to extract their hooks and their bait. Floundering about among the gutted carcasses for hours on end, pushing hook and bait back and up to within inches of the quivering jaws they would normally never have gone near. These men were gratifying some obscure form of vengeance. This psychological factor, this almost automatic loss of self-control on the part of the most hardened man when he finds himself confronted with a shark, is probably responsible for many cases of fatal attack. Very interesting. So Philippe is citing the uh, hatred of man versus shark that goes through the histories. He goes through the history of the shark by the Greek writers all the way back to even the Bible. But what he says is that he's witnessed how even the most hardened men, second in violence only to the monstrous fury of hungry sharks, is the blind hatred of man for this species. So he's actually equating the uh, violence that a shark can inflict and he's saying that man can also afflict that violence on sharks, that it's this psychosis. He actually calls it, right? Doesn't he call it a psychosis here? This psychological factor, this almost automatic loss of self-control on the part of the, of the most hardened man when he finds himself confronted with a shark. A couple of conclusions that you can draw from all of this is that you can also look at, and I wanted to go here, when was the aqualung invented? So the aqualung is the what they called the scuba tank, the scuba system, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. That's what scuba stands for. Aqualung was the first open circuit self-contained underwater breathing apparatus to achieve worldwide popularity and commercial success. This class of equipment is now commonly referred to as a twin hose diving regulator or demand valve. The aqualung was invented in France during the winter of 1942 to 1943 by two Frenchmen, one of them being Jacques Cousteau. The invention revolutionized autonomous underwater diving by providing a compact, reliable system capable of greater depth range and endurance than its precursors. It was a major factor influencing the development of recreational scuba diving after World War II. So what we're looking at is the aqualung, the scuba system, was invented in the early 40s really did not meet commercial grade or uh, recreational dive standards were really made around in the 60s. And, uh, and, and, and so it didn't start to be popular until really up until the, the, the late, the mid 60s to the 70s. So if you can go back to when the aqualung was invented, that scuba divers were just getting into the water after World War II. And now you have when uh, all these observations, and I have a few more by Jacques Cousteau that I'm going to save for later, later episodes when we talk about the oceanic white tip shark. But it just what I'm looking at is that the early stories and the behavior of sharks when the, with the men in the water for the USS Indianapolis. Two takeaways we have here is well, well there's actually three. So let's let's start with the top. Number one is within the Jaws universe, within the Jaws universe. We have to look at that Matt Hooper had, this is the type of shark books that Matt Hooper would have access to. And this is what the uh, conventional wisdom was. The great white was a man eater, and then sharks would actually hunt down, hunt in a certain territory. And that man and human flesh could be on the 
uh, dinner table, as Martin Brody would put it, it'd be like ringing the dinner bell, that sharks could attack humans just like they could attack seals and fish. So that is the conventional wisdom at the time. Outside of the Jaws universe, I wanted to, uh, this is also another example of if we saw what I just read by Philippe Cousteau, is that man has been slaughtering sharks for ages before Jaws. Okay, so if we look at what Jaws is, what what Jaws had an effect on the modern day psyche towards sharks by cementing that fear and obviously exploiting that fear as a the biggest summer blockbuster of all time at that time, it wasn't solely responsible for the killing of sharks, and I don't think that has been communicated successfully throughout the many documentaries and retrospectives that have been produced of Jaws over the last 10 to 15 years. Every extra that I've seen on the DVDs and Blu-rays and all these different documentaries, they always go right to Peter Benchley and they, or they go right to Steven Spielberg and ask about how, oh, about the, about the effects of Jaws on the hunting of sharks and the many sharks that were killed in the wake of Jaws. But what they fail to always say is that this attitude towards sharks was going on for decades before Jaws, okay? Centuries, okay? And that is what we were looking at, is that even Philippe Cousteau, in 1970, in this book, before four years before Jaws was even written and published, he's actually citing man's absolute hatred towards the sharks and how it's a psychological thing that man just snaps into murder mode or revenge mode, vengeance, on, an, on a species that really he's never that never never has attacked anyone. Even people that don't even have a that don't have an intention of going towards the ocean, they still hate sharks. Very interesting. If you look at it like that, is that this attitude was always there. Now remember, I'm not. We're not. We're coming to the defense of Jaws. We're not exonerating Jaws. We're coming to the defense of Jaws, and we're trying to put everything in perspective here. And when Jaws was made, there was already a built-in hatred of sharks and a misunderstanding of sharks at the time. Okay. But one of the really interesting things that this all opens up for is everything I'm reading in this, go, go to all your former pre-Jaws, pre-1970, pre-1974 shark books, is that there's a lot of firsthand accounts are from aggressive of sharks acting aggressive in the water, unprovoked attacks, sharks doing something that we don't normally think of them doing today. And now with today's, I see on Instagram and I see on YouTube, the many different shark scientists and photographers and oceanographers in the water swimming freely with sharks and sharks being very docile and behaving very normal, that not showing any aggression, even giant tiger sharks. We see some of these uh, divers that are swimming and they're, the tiger comes near them and they just push the head down and the shark swims away. Um, it's, a, it's risky behavior. Obviously, it's wild animals that they're doing this with. But the sharks are actually showing, they're not showing an aggression. Now, my question is, after reading this, is that could this be that after, since the 50s, since the 1950s, after 70 to 80 years, um, well, since the 40s, right? So after 70 to 80 years of man being in water via scuba diving and actually extending its range of enjoyment and humans extending their range of enjoyment into the water. We know that our attitude through education, Shark Week, and all the, all, all the different shark science and research and conservation activities, that humans, human attitudes have changed towards sharks. We now see fishermen hooking sharks and setting them free. We see guys, cell phone videos. The other day, I just saw one of a guy who had a thresher shark. It was washed up on shore and he just throws his phone and his keys to his friends and he picks the thresher shark up and he walks into the surf to go and put water back in over its gills and let it go and, and get it back into the open ocean. And I've seen this with a number of videos where now we have fishermen actually working to help save sharks uh, when before they would just have uh, let them die or bashed them or kept them for a trophy. So we know that the human humans' attitudes towards sharks have changed. Is it not, is it 100%? No, but it has changed. But could it be possible that sharks' attitudes towards humans have changed since the 1940s, since the pre-1940s, pre-scuba? All these documented cases that I'm seeing from, uh, we, just read, uh, uh, we just read one with about a, just a random blue shark from Philippe Cousteau 
and how the blue shark was getting very aggressive. It was making circles. It was coming in. And I have a couple more from Jacques Cousteau about aggressive oceanic white tip behavior. Uh, is it possible that as man has been in the water since the 40s, that now we are here in 2024, is it possible that sharks have grown accustomed to seeing humans and scuba divers in the water, that they are not as aggressive in those territories that they, uh, that they exist in? This is now 70 to 80 years. That's enough for generations and generations of sharks to actually exist knowing and realizing and seeing humans that the shark behavior would have changed. The sharks are more accepting of these clumsy aliens that breathe bubbles. Instead of acting out of aggression or out of protection, we have to look at it in proper perspective. When we observe sharks today, we are observing a species of wild animal that has now existed with humans in the water closer than ever before for the better part of th three quarters of a century. And that's what's interesting here is that before that, so if we look at all these shark books before, we can't say that they're all wrong. We can't say that Philippe Cousteau is wrong when he observed a aggressive blue shark and he had to get out of the water. We can't, we have to just say, sit there and say, well, that blue shark, that was pretty much the first time it was seen something of, of maybe it was probably one of the first times it was seen in the ocean, how many scuba divers were back then. It was really just Philippe and his dad, Jacques Cousteau, right? So we had to, whether you were a scientist, but it really wasn't the recreational bombshell that it would become. And now look at that, where we, uh, that the two species are, are growing together. That's something I'm taking away from all of this. Um, do you agree? Do you agree that the back and forth, the shark to man, that man is actually learning more to exist with sharks? And you can just see the difference in the modern day documentaries, just turn on Shark Week and see the shark behavior around people in the water. And they also pick up shark books pre-1970 when scuba diving was in its infancy and read about shark behavior there. So the Jersey attack in 1916 and all that stuff they're talking about in Jaws, uh, we can't doubt that never happened. That did happen. That was a fact. A, 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 a shark was caught with human remains after they caught one or two sharks or no, that the, the, the attack stopped. So was it a rogue shark? Was it territorial? Was it a territorial shark, the, an older shark? That's a whole nother episode to get into that, the Jersey attacks of 1916. But there is evidence of sharks being absolutely more aggressive than they are with what we see today. And I just think that that there's a, that there's a give and take that the sharks are learning to coexist with humans, just like man is learning to, to coexist with sharks. Very interesting stuff here. Final thing: as we come down the pipe here, we have territoriality. the The title of episode seventy four, territoriality. So are sharks territorial? For that, I'm going to go to one last article here. I have an article called Understanding Shark Behavior, Are Sharks Territorial? and How It Influences Their Habitat by Alex Colson, and it was published on June 7, 2023 on wildtrack.com. I'm going to put this in our show notes over at our Telegram channel, and we're going to get right down to it. Was Matt Hooper right? Are sharks territorial? This is a common question that many people have about these fearsome predators of the ocean. While some species of sharks are known to be solitary creatures that prefer to swim alone, others are very territorial and will aggressively defend their territory against other sharks and even humans. Understanding the behavior of sharks and their territorial tendencies is essential for anyone who spends time in the ocean, whether for work or recreation. So I'm going to just skim right down to shark territorial behavior. One of the interesting aspects of shark behavior is their territoriality. Defining territorial behavior. Territorial behavior is sharks in sharks refers to their ability to establish and defend a specific area within their natural habitat. This behavior is not limited to just one species of shark, but rather it is, it is a common trait among many different shark species. One way to think of territorial behavior is akin to a personal space bubble. Just like humans, sharks have boundaries that they defend against intruders. These boundaries can be physical, such as specific reef or section of the ocean, or they can be based on social factors, like competing for a mate or food. Reasons for territoriality. 
There are several reasons why sharks exhibit territorial behavior. Firstly, they use their territory as a hunting ground, which means they can efficiently locate prey and maximize their chances of catching food. Another reason is for mating purposes. As many shark species have a specific breeding area that they defend and will fiercely compete for a potential mate. Interestingly, scientists have also observed that some shark species exhibit non-aggressive territorial behavior. For example, some species establish a territory in order to rest and recover and will only defend it if necessary. This type of behavior, behavior helps sharks conserve energy and ensure that they have a safe space to rest. In conclusion, sharks are territorial creatures. This behavior is an integral part of their lives. Whether they are establishing boundaries to hunt prey or competing with rivals for a potential mate, territorial behavior plays a vital role in their survival. So in answer to the question, are sharks territorial, the answer is a resounding yes. And to read more on this, I will link to this article in our show notes. So yes, sharks are territorial. There is such a thing as territoriality. And this is from June 7th, 2023. So this is modern day shark, uh, shark conventional understanding is that sharks do establish a territoriality behavior. We have seen great whites, they, they will migrate. Great whites will migrate to other areas to where a food source is, like off of Mosul Bay in uh, South Africa, now there, where there is a, a, an ample seal population. They will also migrate to other areas. Now we're seeing what Greg Skolmel, what Dr. Greg Skolmel is doing over uh, off of Cape Cod with the uh, growing seal population, and we are seeing the great white migration patterns taking them up to that territory where they are setting up a territorial hunting behavior up there for the seal population. So territoriality is definitely a theory that you can still agree with, and Matt Hooper was right, all right? And that's that's the thing, is that, it's that, that there is territoriality in essence, in, in a way of finding a food source. However, is that territoriality exist where there are humans swimming? It is not obviously for the humans to be the food source, as Jaws was indicating. But territoriality is a thing, and Matt Hooper was correct. And I believe when he went on, if he were to, if he were to have left the next day and go on to the Aurora for his research, eighteen months at sea, with these other scientists at the time. They were going to be traveling from one area to the other following great white mi migration patterns. Why do we know it's a great white? Because he's telling the doctor on the phone that he has a great white here. He doesn't need to come to Brisbane just yet when he has a great white right here. So he knows that there were they were going to go down to Australia. Australia had big had obviously was where the great white studies was going on down the time with Ron and Valerie Taylor doing their photography down in Australia. So that's where he was headed on the Aurora. So we know that he would eventually have been 18 months at sea, and he would have actually proven that there is a, such a thing as territoriality. Uh, the rogue shark theory was still left up in the air. Um, maybe he was going to try to prove that wrong, but it wasn't going to be centered on, human, uh, as, on humans as the food source. He was going to prove that he was going to be one of the first scientists to show that in our conventional wisdom, to lead to what we now all know the great white to be as an animal that can coexist with humans and that it is migratory. It does not stalk off of a coastline and stay there until it depletes the food source. It will actually move around to other areas of, of ample food sources. Now, jumping into the Jaws universe, jumping into the Jaws universe, there was something else going on around Amity that would lead and attract large sharks and lead to aggressive shark behavior in the waters around Amity Island. And that will be discussed later on as we get into the events of the Book of Quint. But for now, Matt Hooper is known as the rock star marine biologist for a reason, because he was out there saying that he had a love for sharks when nobody else was doing it. He's the first character in cinematic history that I'm aware of that actually openly proclaims his love for sharks. And that should duly be noted going forward as we enjoy the movie Jaws as the greatest movie of all time. Thank you very much for listening to episode 74, Territoriality. I love sharks. You love sharks. Yeah, I love them. I love them. <laughs> Show me the way to go home. I'm tired, I want to go to bed. I
you very much for listening to episode 74. Happy New Year to everyone out there. New Year 2024. This episode was recorded half and half, half before New Year's and half after. So we had a great 2023 as the Book of Quint reaches out to the world. And 2024, we are not stopping. We have a lot of exciting things in store. So stay with us here at the Jaws Obsession. The movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within sections 107 of the Copyright Act. The copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. The materials used here are protected by the Fair Use Guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act, all rights reserved to the copyright owners. Okay, the date to focus now is January 23rd. We'll try to get one or two more episodes in before then, but that is the date for the North American rollout to the Book of Quint. Please go to bookofjawsob.com or bookofquint.com. You can follow the links in the link tree below, the description of this broadcast. And thank you very much for listening to the show, and we enjoy any reviews. You can email me here at jawsob2025 at gmail.com. All the Book of Quint readers out there, please let me know what you think. And let's continue that discussion going forward. As always, thanks for listening. Until the next episode, farewell and adieu. Show me the way to go home.